Well, good morning. 2018, and we are kickstarting 40 days of transformation. Think about the Israelites. A short journey that should have been about that time frame turned into a 40 year wilderness nightmare. So I believe in every new year, we have an opportunity to have a new beginning. That we would no longer wander around the long way, but God would lead us right into everything that he has called for us to step into. And this is also going to be life group connection event where you probably saw some of the tables out there. I want to encourage you, whether you are already in a life group to stay there, whether you have never taken part in doing life with people, to make the plunge today to just join a life group. We've got, we've got them for everything you could imagine. So before you leave today, stop by those tables and see what may be of interest to you and help you on your spiritual journey. But if you have your Bible or smartphone, I want you to pull it out. I want you to look with me in Ephesians. I also want you to pull out your uh, syllabus that you should have got when you walked in so you can follow along today. But I want to ask you this. How many of you... Um, want to see some new things in 2018. The old, the old may have been good, but you're looking for what God has that is best for you. For some of us, we may uh, take on the weight loss journey. How many of you are just saying, I'm, I'm ready to reclaim my weight, okay? Now, in 2017, okay, only a few of you want to reclaim the weight. Two, I'll talk to everyone over here. 2017, you know, I'm saying I'm making the plunge to get back my health, but it didn't last very long. I took up jogging and lo and behold, I kept jogging in and out of restaurants. So that did not last. Um, I tried to uh, work with health coaches. They're like, you know, you've got to eliminate this and that and this. And you know, if you live in, New, you know, this whole South, you basically got to eliminate your whole diet. So that didn't work. And, uh, you know, maybe you can relate to me. Maybe you've started something. Maybe it didn't work. Maybe you're like... Uh, this 10 days of fasting coming up, maybe it's the only way that you're going to be able to shed off a few of those pounds. So I want to encourage you guys to join in with us with that. But for whatever it may be, maybe you're wanting to take your relationship. How do you want to take your relationship to another level? Take your marriage to another level. You know, for men, it may not be saying some of the dumb things that we have said to our wives or our girlfriends. Let me give you an example. Uh, this guy was, was talking to his wife about how good looking she was and just admiring her. And she says, you know, the reason that God made me so beautiful is number one, that you would fall in love with me. And number two, that I would be dumb enough to marry you. And, uh, you know, so, you know, dumb things can get us into trouble. Or maybe you're here and maybe you're not married. Maybe you're looking for the love of your life. I want to encourage you. This can be the year that God fulfills everything. I always say when you, you know, love is like a triangle. When you make God number one, everything else falls into place. If you're looking for that significant other, you want to find him or her right there in that same place you are looking for and going after the presence of God. But in Ephesians 1, starting in verse 1, we're going to jump into something because I know more than anything, we need grace and peace in our life. Amen? You want to be able to lay your head down at night and know that you've got peace with God, peace with your loved ones, and operating in the grace that he has called you to operate into. But this letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I'm writing to God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. I want you to underline grace and peace. All of us want to receive more grace and peace. Interesting thing, Paul is writing to the Christians in Ephesus and why he is writing that, he is actually in Asia Minor, which is today known as Turkey, and he's writing these letters inside the prison of a jail cell. Now, I don't know about you, but if you were locked up and serving possibly a life sentence, oftentimes we may be just thinking about how are we going to get out of here? How are we going to cope with not having our loved ones available? How are we going to maintain our grace and peace? But Paul looking at what we talked about earlier, forgetting those things that are behind him is continuing to press on to the mark. And one of the marks is to see others connect and, and grow in their relationship to God. So as Paul's writing this letter, he knows that he, he's going to rely on his friends to deliver that letter. 
Now, how many of you like would want to be the guy or the gal delivering these kind of letters? They didn't have email. They didn't have social media. They couldn't Snapchat. They couldn't send out the tweet. They had to rely on a handwritten letter. And it just speaks to us how much Paul had a deep love for the Ephesian church. But these epistles, especially in Ephesians that we're going to go through this year, are called the prison epistles. It's where we get the book of Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians and Philemon. But Paul is writing these things to the church while he is serving his time in jail, and he's going to rely on a trusted friend, Tychius. How many would you like to have that kind of name? You know, aren't you glad that your mother named you what she named you or your father named you? But very unusual name, but I'll tell you what, I wouldn't trade the world to have a friend like this man. This man was serving alongside Paul even while he was in prison. He would go and receive these letters and he would be the one that would deliver them. Imagine delivering a letter. You're not really sure what the contents of that letter are, but you are the, the mailman, so to speak, to this letter. So though he was, had an unusual name, though you don't really hear too much about him in the Bible, this man of God uh, really did some extraordinary things in allowing these letters to get out. But I want you to look at this again in Ephesians 1.1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints are, that are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Don't you love how Paul pens it in his own hands, calling us saints? So many translations emphasize the word holy or faithful, but Paul, in one of the most closest translations, describes the people of God as saints. Now, you may be thinking about, hey, I'm a fan of the saints, and they're getting ready to play today. And uh, you may be thinking about a lot of other th saints, maybe uh, growing up Catholic saints that, that were throughout uh, the Catholic church, okay? But what Paul is writing about is not just the people that we, wow, esteem to admire and be like. He's writing about you and I. He's writing about ordinary, everyday people that are called to do extraordinary things. And that's what makes this 40 days so significant to us. It's not so far out of our reach that we can't see transformation. Things can happen in just the blink of an eye. But the saints that Paul is writing to, they're committed to living holy lives. How many of you want to commit more this year to living holy? And to, do, to be holy you know, oftentimes people think, well, I'll, when I get right, then I'll go to church. But the only way we can truly become holy is if we, what? Number one, connect with other believers, connect with the Lord Jesus Christ, not forsake the assembling together on these Sunday mornings or Wednesday nights or finding yourself in a life group. It's an amazing thing. So we're going to look at some things, especially what Jesus has to say, because how many of you want to be a successful saint? I know a lot of successful businessmen, athletes, uh, whatever you, you know, may deem is successful, but God wants us to be successful saints. So if you have your syllabus, pull it out and write this down. Being a successful saint in 2018 will require subordinating every relationship under Jesus. Luke 14, 26, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else, your father and your mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life, Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. How many of you had trouble hearing that word hate? I mean, doesn't the Bible say we're not called to hate? But yet Paul's using some really, uh, you know, some strong language here about hate. But let me give you the original translation of hate in Arabic. It literally means to love less than. In other words, we're not literally called to be at odds or physical or whatever we may think emotional abuse to our, to our families and friends, but we are called to love them less than the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus has to be the magnificent obsession of our life. When we fall in love with him, everything else, though it may be less than, how many of you know it will still be greater than if we just try to love our family and have no time for Jesus Christ? Amen? Because literally love is an overflow of a relationship. And when we oftentimes get tapped out, we are giving out to people something that we don't have. Our, our love bank is essentially empty and we're giving out and we're so just emotionally, spiritually, whatever it may be, relationally bankrupt, we have nothing to give. And that's where we get into trouble. But when we make Jesus Christ the Lord of our lives and spend time with him, it's just the bubbling overflow spills over into every relationship. 
But I want to look at something here, what the Bible teaches. To be real followers of Jesus, we've got to passionately love our family members. How many of you want to passionately love your family members? One person. Okay, for the rest of us, okay, for the rest of us, you may have that spouse, you may have the coworker, you may have uh, the in-laws, or in some cases, the outlaws, the most wanted, you know, they may never show up around here, or daddy's going to take care of business, whatever it may be, okay? We all have those people in our life that tend to irritate us this year, especially over these next 40 days. We've got to say, God, help me to passionately love those that are less than lovable. I want to be, I want to have the love that no one else can have. Now, listen to this kind of love. I'm going to read something. A man went on vacation. He was in the Middle East, and he brought his family, brought his mother-in-law. Can I get an Amen. While they were visiting Jerusalem, his mother-in-law suddenly died. And with the death certificate in hand, he went to the American consulate to make arrangements to send the body back. Now, during his making arrangements to sending the body back, the the consulate was just just encouraging, hey, listen, this is going to be very expensive to get your mother-in-law back. You know, it's easier if we can just bury her here. And he's like, no, listen, you don't understand. I've got to get my mother-in-law back. Now, how many of you know that's a well-trained husband? Okay, very well trained. He's willing to pay whatever it costs to bring his mother-in-law back. So finally, they're going back and forth and like, sir, this just doesn't make any sense. Really, what's the real issue? Why you're going to take her back? He looks around and says, I got to tell you something. I hear there's a guy that was born here that died, and three days later, he rose again. And I'm afraid if I bury her here, there might just be that little chance she may rise again. Now, we don't want to be like that husband, even though you thought he was being a good husband. We want to be those that love our wives. Look at this in Colossians 3.17. Husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. Titus 2.4. Older women must train the younger women to love their husbands. Can I get an amen? Man, older ladies. Ladies that, you know, you've got some, you've got some years on you. You've got some traction on you in your marriage. Raise up those, those ladies. Raise up uh, even those that aren't your natural daughters. Teach them the ways of how to be a good wife. But to be honest, another way that we're going to become a real follower of Jesus is we've got to purposefully love other people. John 13, 34 and 35, listen to this. Jesus declared, just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. How many of you know talk is cheap? I mean, we can say how much, you know, I love you, but the reality is, what are our actions saying? You know, I, I, I've been married almost 19 years, and I, I don't think I've ever been short of telling my wife I loved her, but I've been short a lot of times with demonstrating my love to her. And I think if we're truly going to experience everything that God has for us, then we've got to be willing to, to do the work required. We've got to be willing to put aside our own agenda, put aside our own pride. You know, I've learned this, apologizing. You know, you know my thing in, 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 in December, I've, I had to refrain from all the apple pies, pumpkin pies, all these pies, and try to eat more humble pie. And how many of you know God is amazing at answering my prayer? I was eating a lot of humble pie this, this uh, last year, and I'm probably going to be eating it this year. But, you know, one of the amazing things about humble pie is you learn to say you're sorry. Apologizing doesn't always mean you're right or wrong. It just means you value the relationship more than you do your own ego. And for some of us to experience success, we've got to lose our ego and start truly loving the other people that God has sent in our lives because we're passing people every day. They all wear a mask. And if the mask was really off and we realized we held the key, just a little bit of love. It's amazing what just an encouraging text could mean to somebody. Just saying, hey, how you doing? I see you. A pat on the back. It's amazing how it just opens people's hearts to love. Love provokes a response, and you can sense when somebody is genuinely caring for you, can't you? And you can also feel it when you walk into a room and there's strife and there's this animosity. It just feels cold. Listen, we've got to turn the cooker up in our hearts. We've got to love people well in 2018, especially other people. It's easy sometimes to love our family. Sometimes it's difficult to love other people. Or it's easy to love other people and difficult to love our family. Whatever you find yourself in, make the switch. Make the, you know, find that center of balance where you're loving your family 
and loving people very well. And God will do remarkable things in your life in 2018. And that's why if you're not already connected to a life group, get involved in a life group. You will find the the switch of family and friends. And you'll find that the people that were once strangers all of a sudden become your family. I don't have family here other than my, you know, my wife's side of the family. I'm really kind of alone here. And I'll tell you what, if it wasn't for you guys, you know, I don't know what I would do. You guys make me feel like family, you know? And uh, it's amazing, you know? You guys help beefing me up. You guys, you know, now you've got to help me contribute in my New Year's resolutions and helping me lose some of this and not so much of the pies, but, you know, telling me how I can better relate to you, well, you know, what we, how we can better make this year better for each one of us, Amen. But in John 14, 21, Jesus said, those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. We've got to accept the fact that if we're going to say we love God, then we got to obey him. When I married Jody, you know, and I remember Pastor Dennis saying this, you know, when he married his wife, you know, the first thing he told her was that, honey, I want you to know you're going to be number two. You're going to be number two on the bus because Jesus is going to be number one in my life. And you know, she didn't have a problem. Jody didn't have a problem. But the reality is they knew that if I made Jesus, if our senior leader made Jesus, you know, everything about his life, then the marriage will, be, will, will just work out, won't it? Now, let me tell you this. I can't speak for a pastor, but I can speak for myself. Do you think I was always good about that? Come on, you know me better than that. No, I've slipped up. I've made mistakes. I seem to go backwards at times. God's working with me just as he's working with you. But I've made it my aim to make God number one. And because of that, he just works things out. And then we're always going through those trying times in our relationships and in our marriages. But the reality is, if you're, if you're smooth sailing right now in 2018 or whether you are about ready to jump ship before you do anything, Get your heart right. Get, get before the Lord. Make Jesus number one and see if he doesn't start working this thing out. Look at this. Being a successful saint in 2018 requires suffering. Cover your ears if you don't want to hear this. Suffering hardship for Jesus, Luke 14, 27. And you cannot be my disciple if you do not carry your own cross. I look around today and I see crosses. Some of you are wearing beautiful crosses. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. He's saying you've got to carry at times suffering. I I think about some of the the suffering and loss that I've experienced throughout my life, the loss of one of our children. I think about, you know, that time of just, Lord, why? Why did this have to happen to me? I've seen so much good throughout the world. You've done so much for other people. Why? Why did this happen to me? And I don't know why. I don't know why sometimes bad things happen to good people, but here's what I do know that sometimes suffering happens in our lives. And because of suffering, let me tell you this, before that happened in my life, I don't think I really could be empathetic to other people. You know, you, as maybe a traveling, uh, somebody who travels a lot, you want to just come in and just lay hands and see God move. But you know, when that happened, I empathized. I had compassion like I never had before. I feel like I grew a million years during that time. You know, it, this, how many of you have ever experienced suffering? How many maybe you've lost somebody that you've loved? You know, and because of that, listen, you, God doesn't want to make you bitter. He wants to make you better. He wants to give you a greater expanse of compassion so you can relate to a lost and a dying world. You know why Jesus touched the leper before he healed him? Because he'd never been touched. The man suffered his whole life, never being around people. And the Lord didn't want to come in like the famous evangelist and say, be healed and rise and be healed and he goes away. He wanted him to know that I see you. I care about you. I love you. And, you know, that's something beautiful. That's the paradox. We suffer hardship. How many of you have suffered hardship in 2017? Okay? But think about this. How much more glory is God working in your life if you'll just turn that over to Jesus? It reminds me of this story of these two guys that were going hiking. How many of you love to be in the woods? They're going hiking. And while they're hiking, they encounter this bear, and this bear is chasing them. And so that's not good, okay? And they're starting to try to outrun this bear, which is virtually impossible. And, man, the farther they go, they finally are getting out of breath. One of the guys stops and stops the other guy. He's like, listen, i got to catch my breath. He's like, come on, we got to go. Listen, I've got this heavy backpack on. He says, I know, but it's not going to make a difference one way or another, whether you take it off. But, but, okay, here. So he takes it off and gives it to the other guy. He's like, why are you handing me this? So that I can at least outrun you. See, sometimes we don't, we, we don't want to suffer. We want somebody else to suffer. Hey, carry my baggage. Carry all my drama. Carry me. I can't do this anymore. And that's not fair to somebody else. Have you ever been in that kind of relationship too? Where somebody's always dumping on you? 
You know, one thing I realized really quick is my wife is not my mama. (laughs) Sometimes it was hard. I was a mama's boy, and I wanted to go to her with everything. And there's times that you can say things to people, but what I'm saying is you don't want the spouse, you don't want your friends, you don't want somebody to be the dumping ground. You want to learn to go to Jesus. Jesus, I'm suffering. I know you're not, you you know what it feels like to go through this. Jesus, I want to give you my my junk. I want to give you all this heavy stuff. I don't want to leave so-and-so with this because, you know, what happens is we slow somebody else down. We cause somebody else to trip up. Let's not do that in 2018. Real followers of Jesus. Say real. Real followers of Jesus. They're, they're loyal. They, they're full of love. Their hearts are just expanded to, to do what God has called them to do. And that is at times to suffer hardship. And sometimes being a follower of Jesus means, number one, our family will disown us. How many of you ex- ever experienced that? Number two, our friends will make fun of us. How many of you ever experienced that? Being made fun of, being one of those Jesus people, you know? Wow, you know? Those, are, those people are kind of weird. Number three, our boyfriend or girlfriend breaks up on us. Have you ever been have a breakup? Do you know that Jody broke up with me while we were dating? It was a catastrophe. She broke up. You know why she broke up? She says I wasn't following Jesus. Now, I don't know what happened, but I'll tell you what. There was something about between God and her. Man, they teamed together, and it did something in my heart. You know, and that, but that doesn't always happen. I had to make a choice whether I'm going to follow Jesus and be, make him the Lord or whether I was going to continue on the pathway that I was that wasn't good. So some of us, some breakups might have happened because they were the best thing for us because they were leading us in a direction that God wasn't wanting us. But sometimes God, the devil wants to destroy marriages and that's not God's will. God wants us to be whole and healthy. Amen. So look at that. Sometimes we've got to do that. I'm reminded of sometimes the suffering. uh, St. Patrick, uh, when I was in Ireland, I love this. I heard the story about St. Patrick. He was baptizing a pagan king that had just gotten saved. And it was his custom to have this kind of like this big medallion, you know, kind of like the Mr. T medallion. And uh, he had this big cross medallion as he was going down to baptize this pagan king. The, the, this this uh, symbol, this cross, went into the, went to the king's foot, and it cut him, but he didn't want to say anything because he was getting baptized. And, and St. Patrick was looking down, like the water's filling up with blood. He's like, what's going on? He's like, the, the cross is in my foot. He's like, why didn't you tell me? He said, I thought that was part of suffering. <laughs> See, some of us are going through stuff that we, some of our suffering's unnecessary because we're just not opening our hearts and telling people what's going on. Look at this next one. Being a successful uh, saint in 2018 will require surrendering ownership of our lives. Luke 14, no one can come be, become my disciple without giving up everything for me. Here's what Jesus is going to say to us. To be Jesus's faithful followers, we must love him more than our possessions. Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. How many of you know that, that right there is a paradox? We need resources to operate and live our lives. But at the same time, God's saying, that cannot be number one. When you make me number one, how many know everything else falls into place? When you make money your God, what happens? You never have enough. When you make God your God, it seems like God begins to bless you with more than enough. Didn't say that he'll give you everything. He just says he'll give you what you need. Okay? God wants to bless us. But we've got to love him more than our cars, more than our houses, even at times in my house, more than our cats. Now, that's really easy for me, but that may be difficult for Jody. We've got to love him more than our possessions. Look at this next one. We've got to love him more than our pursuits. Mark 8, 34. If any of you wants to be a follower, you must put aside your selfish ambition, shoulder your cross, and follow me. How many of you have pursuits? You want to start that business. You want to do great things for God. You want to build his church. You want to do all these things. But in our pursuit of this, make sure he's still number one. Don't lose him in the process. Look at this next one. To be a faithful father, we got to love him more than pleasure. Woo! How many of you know God is a God of pleasure? Bible says at his right hand are what? Depression evermore? Pleasure evermore. There is, there is no high. There is no feeling that nothing else can give you in this world. It's all counterfeit because the devil doesn't create anything. He just mimics something. He counterfeits God's pleasure. And when we make God first in our lives, he will make our lives so much more pleasurable. How many of you want to have more pleasure? Just more pleasure. Lord, you just want to wake up and know that you're having fun today. Joy. How many of you, you know, we lose our joy. It's easy to lose our joy. 
God wants us to find that pleasure again, a pleasure of just loving him. Reminds me of a story of a missionary told coming back from China, serving in China, and she told her story. The hearts were moved, tears were shed, and at the end, this businessman walked up and said, I would give everything to do what you did. And the, the missionary looked at this lady, and she says, I gave up everything. See, it's easy to say I'd give up all this, but the real thing is what, what are you willing to let go of in 2018 to find your pleasure in Jesus? Let me give you a few things that we can use. These are habits. Let me just know, how many of you got a habit that you want to kick in 2018? One person, thank you. Okay, a few of you. Okay, we all got habits and hiccups and hangups that God wants to get rid of, but how are we going to get rid of it? Let me give you a few reasons why and how we can be more faithful. Number one, we got to pray. We got to be consistent in our prayer life. Luke 18, 1, Jesus told his disciples and the story to show that they should always pray. That's why these next 10 days of prayer and fasting, I want to encourage you, it might be giving up uh, coffee. It may be giving up food. It may be giving up Coke. It may be giving up watching the saints. Um, whatever it may be, you know, um, God's going to speak to you. Get into prayer and fasting. Look at this next one. We got to commit to uh, faithful uh, commitment to Bible reading and study in our lives. Uh, in Matthew 4, 4, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We cannot live on a diet of just once a week. We've got to get in our Bibles, turn on Audible, listen to a, a translation while you're in your car, while you're doing something, putting on your makeup. Listen to the Word of God. It's amazing what it can do for your life. Look at this next one. We've got to be committed uh, not just in, in prayer, not just in Bible study, but we've got to connect to other people. How many of you are saying, 2018, I'm going to be a part of a life group. I want to connect to other people. I'm tired of doing life alone. One person, thank you. Um, you know, I, I, hope by, I hope by the time you leave, I can just somewhat convince you and God can say, you know what, you need connection. You need to be a part of doing life with other people. But one of these other things that we're going to look at is serving the Lord has to be consistent in our life. We've got to be willing to serve the Lord. You know, it's amazing what will happen. When you are a lover, when I fell in love with Jody, it was so easy to serve her. When those times when I was getting goofy in my walk, it was difficult to serve her. But when we, may, when we love something, it doesn't feel like serving. It feels like I get to do this. But when we don't and we just become a worker, then it's, oh, we, we grudgingly have to do things at times. Hey, can you, can you tell the difference? Maybe in 2017, you grudgingly at times walked into church or came to a life group. Let's 2018, let's like, God, I want to enjoy it. I get to go to church. I get to go to a life group. I get to do life with other people. Lord, I want to faithfully serve you. Acts 1, uh, verse 8. It says, Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witness telling people about me everywhere. How many of you want to have that kind of power? Everywhere you go, you are telling people about Jesus. You're telling them. That's, that's a supernatural power. How many know it's very difficult sometimes to open your mouth about Jesus? Do you realize sometimes it's real easy when you're in church? How many of you know we're all like the evangelists when we're in church? We're all talking about Jesus, but then we go to the restaurants. And we're talking, and hey, where's my food? You know, the service is horrible. Or, 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 you know, why is this person, why am I stuck in traffic? I got to get home to the Saints game. Or we're yelling at our screen. Uh, whatever it may be, you know, we've got to be willing to come to that place of telling others about Jesus, not just with words, but with our actions. Husbands, what would happen? Because I can speak to you. What would happen if you say, you know what, this year, whether it's my wife or my girlfriend, I'm going to love them so well that people just want to, they want to they know what I have. Wives, whether it may be your husband or a boyfriend, whatever it may be, I'm going to love them the way Christ would, would, loves me, and I'm receiving that love. I'm going to show that love back. I'm going to speak into their lives. I'm going to help my husband be everything that God has called them to be. Or maybe it's your boss or a coworker. Instead of just like, I'm ready to leave my job, I'm going to be like, what would happen if I changed my attitude? And instead of being bitter and critical, I start encouraging my boss or speaking life into him. What would happen? What would happen? Before you make that decision to do something completely off the, off, the, off the wall, make a decision that you are going to try with God's help to be an encourager and to tell others about Jesus Christ. Because in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, go and make disciples. That is it right there, G-O. People are like, I'm waiting for a word. I'm waiting for God to speak. Here it is right here, G-O. What is that? Go. It didn't say stop. Put your foot on the brake. Don't go farther. Get everything right. Then maybe if you're just, if you're lucky, I'll let you go. He said, G-O, go. Go into your neighborhood. Go into the Superdome. 
Go into your church. Go into your workplace. Go into the supermarket. Everywhere you go, you're telling people. You're demonstrating. You're smiling. You're laughing. You're, you're hugging. You're, whatever it is, you're speaking other people's love languages. And I'm telling you what, what are they going to see in you? The big J. We got to get a big, uh, we got to get those jerseys that have J on it because we are on Team Jesus. We're cheering on the saints, and we want to see them go to the playoffs, but heaven is cheering Team Jesus on, saying, I want to see you go to the playoffs. I want to see you take it all the way, the distance. Go, go, and they're cheering us all on. Even those of us that feel like we're on the sidelines or on the bench, God is cheering us on. Let me just, let me close with this beautiful story that, that, that I read that I, I think is going to just, just put the seasoning on everything that God's doing right now, and it's, it's a story of Roy Robinson. And he wrote these words. My ship, the West Virginia, docked at Pearl Harbor on the evening of December 6, 1941. A couple of the fellows and I left the ship that night and attended a Bible study. About 15 sailors sat in a circle on the floor. And as they were going around, they were reciting their favorite scripture. Now, the only one that Roy could think of at this time was John 3, 16. And lo and behold, right before it got to Roy, his buddy said John 3, 16. Roy realized he looked like a fool. He didn't know one verse to say. And he made a decision that night that I am going to know my Bible, that I am going to be a faithful follower of Jesus. Well, later that night, as he went to bed, he heard this words thinking, Robinson, you're a fake. And at 7.55 the next morning, he was awakened by the ship's alarm ordered by the battle station. 360 planes of the Japanese Imperial Fleet were attacking our ships and our ministry and our military installations. My men and I raced our machine gun emplacement, and all we had was practice ammunition. So for the first 15 minutes of the two-hour battle, all we were firing was blanks. I made up my mind as the Japanese bullets slammed into our ship. If I escape with my life, I will get serious about following Jesus, who was Roy Robinson. Roy went on to found Dawson Troughton and helped him found the Navigators, a great discipleship ministry of college students. He led the follow-up ministry in 1990 in Billy Graham's crusade, and there's probably been no other person outside of Billy Graham that has seen so much at one time ministry to young people as Roy Robinson and the Crusaders. Much of his life after that, after he got out of the military, he went back to Southeast Asia and poured in to raise up another generation. Now, I loved what Roy said. He said, for the first 15 minutes, we were just firing blanks. See, some of us might be firing blanks at our enemies. We think we know what we're talking about. We think we know all the scripture. We think we can do all this stuff, but we're not in a relationship with Jesus. We haven't been spending time with him. We've not been connecting with other believers. We've not been those real followers of Jesus. And you only know right now, only you know, your heart knows. Are you shooting real bullets? Are you helping save lives? Or are you just shooting fake bullets, masquerading as a faithful follower of Jesus. My friend, as we just close right now, as you just bow your head, as you just stand with me right now, I want to just ask you this question. Have you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? Maybe, maybe you've gone to church all your life. Maybe you know, you know the book, but you don't know him. And you're saying, I don't want to shoot blanks. I don't want to be hard on myself anymore. I want to know that I know that I know that when I lay my head down tonight, or when the next attack comes, or when my spouse or my boss may be pushing my buttons, I want to know that I'm not firing blanks. I want to know that I'm, I'm following Jesus. And I need that love that you talked about, Rich. So if that's you right now, and you're just saying, I want to know Jesus, I want to make him the Lord of my life, or I want to reconnect to Jesus, and I want to, I want to this day forward serve him with all my heart, I want you just to repeat this prayer with me out loud. Father, in Jesus' name, Forgive me of my sins. I need you. I can't do this on my own. So right now, I make Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. So that from this day forward, I can do what you have called me to do. And I can love the world well. In Jesus' name. And the saints of God say, amen.